Thank you so much for another episode of Earnestly Speaking with your host, Ernest Owens, myself. <laughs> so, thank you all so much for being here and to the lovely audience watching at home. This is the election special for Earnestly Speaking, which I'm super excited because, you know, the midterm elections are coming on November 8th, all right? And we are in a battleground state. Pennsylvania is a battleground state, which means that the whole country, the whole world is watching what happens for election because this midterm election season is going to be really important. It's going to be about, I guess people are saying, saving our democracy, right? You know, whatever that means to some people. You know, I'm not picking a political side on this episode. <laughs> but I am saying that it is important that we do take the election seriously, that we are voting and we're practicing our civic duties. I know, for one, I would not be here if it was not for people to be able to vote. I would not be have, able to be married as a black queer person, right? I wouldn't even be able to be here and be able to have a show like this without the power of the vote and people's civic participation. So this episode is really focused on what's happening right now, what are we hearing, what are we seeing, how we're feeling, and how we're going to show up to the polls and make a difference. And I think so many people have taken the right to vote for granted. A lot of people have said, look, you know, if I go to the polls, I don't. But, you know, if we can make it to a Telfar bag sale, okay, at 12 sharp, and make sure we got that Telfar color that we wanted, speaking for myself, then I know I can make it to the polls on November 8th and do what I have to do. But some people feel differently. There's different ideas out there. There's different candidates out there. And we're going to talk about this show in this episode. So, for starters, just getting people's thoughts about it, how are you feeling about the midterm? Like, what's your mind about the midterm? Like, how do you feel about it right now? I'm gonna look at my audience. Anybody wanna tell me how you're feeling so far? Do you feel good about it? You feel mid? What's your thoughts? Yes, you. Oh my goodness, you look lovely. Hi, Aaron. So, what's your name? Kelly. Hi, Kelly. Hi. So, how do you feel about the midterms right now? Like, where you're at in Pennsylvania as a voter, yeah. like, how do you feel about it? Are you feeling good? You think it's easy? You think it's gonna be a lot of hard work? What's your vibe? Well, my good friend and I have been canvassing, so we've kind of gotten sort of a feel of what the voters are, are kind of thinking out there. But frankly, I'm, I'm scared. So, I'm, you know, I wanna make sure that things don't go down that just oppress people who, need those rights. I mean, it's, it's, it's everyone, it's women, it's LGBTQ. I mean, it's everybody that's, it's this important that people show up and vote. It just is. And like, until that happens and we get our democracy back, I'm not going to stop. So. Absolutely. So what is one thing that you care about the most? Like what is one issue to the polls in this election? You know, cause there's a lot of stuff. Every year is always something different, but what is specifically about this election is driving you on November 8th? Well, so abortion rights. I mean, um, I've had several friends that have had safe abortions. I've had family relatives that prior to um, Roe v. Wade um, had illegal abortions and almost lost their lives. So it's really important that we not only protect that, but it spills into so many other issues like HIPAA and, you know, I mean, it's just everything could be taken away in one fell swoop. It's that important. People's voices need to be heard. They have to be. I agree. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. So an important point. There are so many issues that are on the table right now with this election. And it's, it's hard because everybody always says every election is, is a big deal. Every, every, this one is the one. But this one really do. And, and again, people have different thoughts on it, like they're scared. You know, I'm, I'm a little worried myself because I think that, you know, 2020 happened, right? There was a change of command and leadership and people thought that there was gonna be some immediate sweeping change that was gonna automatically happen. And in some case, people did get a nice breath of relief, but then we saw quickly in 2021 that things have gotten a little different. And then we got to 2022 and things are still, you know, look at my watch. Still not there yet. And so I'm, I'm curious to know to some people, what was your thoughts about the 2020 election and where we were? That was the presidential race compared to where we are now. Have you felt there's been a difference? Do you feel like, you know, on topics like student loans and other things, do you feel like there's differences that have changed? Like, what's your mood about it? Let me, you know, anybody in the audience who have any thoughts about it? Yes, yes, you. Thank you for coming on. 
Hi, what's your name? Amanda. Hi, Amanda. <laughs> so um, what are your thoughts about, have, you know, you voted in 2020. You was a voter that, you know, did your thing. Now we're in 2022, and there was a lot of people that thought that we would be having a different conversation about the midterms. What's your thoughts about it now? I mean, I think we saw the importance of voting and the importance of civic engagement. Um, obviously, there's been a lot of... Um, uh, We've, we've fallen back a lot, you know, the last two years, whether it's yeah. abortion rights, whether, I mean, we've had some student loan progress, but we see that, um, you know, when it comes to, we're a lot we're more bipartisan now. So I think that's really important. And I think for me, um, with uh, John Fetterman, I'm really excited because I think if he's able to win, it can really show the rest of the country that progressive candidates can win. And we can really, um, like, change the country and go back to, you know, prioritizing the rights of the, the oppressed. So Thank you. Thank you for that. Really good point. Thank you so much. So she's named the candidate. I didn't pick the candidate. She named the candidate. John Fetterman is running for a U.S. Senate. And, you know, there's been a lot of talks about things being more bipartisan now, um, which in some sense that feels good, some sense it feels not as progressive. You know, we do have this weird moderate swing happening, especially in Pennsylvania, um, where, you know, people say, I live in Philly, but Philly is not Pennsylvania. You know, I grew up, listen, I grew up in Houston. And so when people used to talk to me about Texas, I'd be like, listen, I lived in Houston. I had a lesbian mayor, okay, who had black adopted children. That was how progressive we are in Houston compared to Texas. Because when you look at Greg Abbott in Texas, it is a different story. Now, Pennsylvania is interesting because Philadelphia is progressive for the most part, but they don't have any gay mayors or gay city council people. So people that be like, oh, you know, the East Coast is super liberal. I'm like, eh, you know, pockets, it's a little funny over there. But what we see is that cities and areas do not represent the entire state. And so when we're looking at someone like John Fetterman, who, you know, won the Democratic primary by a landslide, you know, compared to some people that thought you have to go moderate, you have to go Connor Lamb, you have to go in these different directions. And Pennsylvania Democrats at the primary said, actually, no, you don't have to do that. And even though he was so progressive, the support for his opponent, who was more moderate, came in Philadelphia. Now, there were a couple of wards who made some different decisions. But overall, people were trying to go the more moderate route. And so it, it makes me think about politics and how it's changed over time because of the fact that in cities like Philadelphia, people are looking for safer bets. But I think the odds have gotten really extreme. When you think about where we are in Philadelphia, so John Fetterman, who many people consider more progressive, he's on the far end of the Democratic Party. But on the Republican side, we have a guy named Dr. Oz you know, who was on TV. I, I, I heard some chatter in the crowd, in the audience, some dissent. But, you know, <laughs> Dr. Oz is, 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 the, is the senatorial candidate. He was big on TV. He was big on Oprah. He was big on all the different, you know, avenues. And he's going against someone with, who has political experience. He has no political experience. But we have seen in previous elections, you know, starting in 2016, you don't have to have any political office experience to get elected. You don't even have to know what the Constitution is. You don't even have to know what the Bill of Rights are. You don't have to know what the First Amendment means to become elected to office. So as many people thought he was a joke, there was people who thought that Trump was a joke. I remember back in the day when I was writing a HuffPost, there were people that were, they put Donald Trump in the comedy section on the HuffPost. HuffPost comedy, they put his race in the comedy section. They treated it like it was a joke and it was laughable and they did not run anything. And then the midterm started to come in 2016 and they started to move a lot of the news and the press about him to serious news. But it was already too late because you know what they say, laugh now, cry later. People was laughing and then people were crying later. So now when we have someone like Dr. Oz coming around, people are like, yeah, it's a joke but the jokes are not the same. You see people on social media saying he's not from Philly, he's not from Pennsylvania, he lives in New Jersey, but that hasn't stopped the fact that he's on the ballot on November 8th. It doesn't stop the fact that he still is running for office and that he has views that people have to figure out. This man won the nomination. He won the Republican nomination. People thought that he was better than the other umpteenth options that they had on the ballot. So I'm wondering to people who've been voting for a longer time, Who's been voting longer than me? I'm, you know, 31, so you know it's different by the time this show airs. <laughs> um, what is, what is, what is their, your thoughts about elections? You know, tell us about it. Oh, I love your button. It says, "This is what a radical feminist looks like." Well, we love feminists. A round of applause. <laughs> so, what's your name? My name is Chris. Hi, Chris. So, tell us, as a voter, as somebody who's been voting, 
How do you feel about this current election cycle, voting, democracy, as someone who's voted longer than I've been alive? Yeah, we have to be getting out the vote. And I think what both Amanda said and others have said, it's really important for us to realize they're coming for our bodies. Uh, you know, that Dr. Oz was endorsed by Trump. That's all we should need to know, to know that he should have zero support from our communities. But they're coming for women's bodies. They're coming for trans bodies. They're coming for black people's bodies. We see them coming for gay men's bodies with trying to deny PrEP. And so we need Fetterman and we need Shapiro in office to make sure that these bodies are protected because Oz is out to get us. He's out to get us. And we need to make sure that we get all the votes out there. And I lived through Reagan. I know the difference oh, wow. that an appalling candidate can make for real lives through the AIDS epidemic and the way that he as president was silent for years about the many gay men and others who were dying of AIDS. So. I've learned that lesson. We have to take this really seriously. We have to take this election seriously. We have to get all of our friends out to vote. And we have to make the case to them that this is truly life and death for the, for the folks that we care about. Thank you. So real quickly before we, um, before you know, I, I'm wondering, have you encountered any voters who are kind of like indifferent or feeling like, you know, they're, they, they're undecided right now? You said that earlier, you said that, you know, there are people like, once he has a Trump endorsement, that should be a no-brainer. Have you met people who are indifferent about this? And what have those conversations been like? Yeah, I think that people sometimes have a right to be indifferent because the Democratic Party hasn't always advocated for the issues that really matter. So housing, uh, good health care, mm -hmm. you know, we have to make the case for the folks out in the street who are indifferent, who say, why does it make a difference for me to vote? It makes a difference because you're going to get better health care. It means you're going to get rental assistance or your, your housing isn't going to be destroyed through gentrification. And I think, frankly, uh, our candidates don't speak out on those issues enough. True. And so we need to advocate ourselves with those candidates to put these issues front and center. And I think that is what we saw with Hillary Clinton, that she didn't speak quite enough about the issues that were of concern to those folks who decide to sit home uh, during that election. And so I hope that both Fetterman and Shapiro will learn that lesson and begin speaking up, up about these truly progressive life-saving issues. Gotcha. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's just a lot of thoughts, a lot of insights. So thank you. Um, very much so. I mean, there is, a, it is an interesting attitude, right? It's because for so long in the p political system, it was always this narrative of like, oh my goodness, you know, you got to go to the polls because of Trump, the, the oogie boogie Trump you know, monster, which is a real thing. It is a boogie, boogie Trump monster. But there was a lot of people that thought that that fear alone was going to compel people to go to the polls. And people just was like, look, whether I had, you know, Obama in office or I had Bush or I had other people, you know, I'm still where I'm at. Or I'm, you know, you know, a little better, but not enough to make me feel propelled to do more, right? Rights are being lost. We're not gaining, you know, we're not gaining anything, actually. We're actually trying to preserve what we lost to hopefully get to a point where we can get additionals. You know what I mean? It's a weird math to it, you know, when I think about it. I think about, like, how, you know, wait, when Obama was president, that a lot of people were thinking about advancing what we had. So, you know, if there was conversations about, you know, women's right to choose, how many more rights for women to choose? We were thinking about political office. We were thinking about having the first woman president. Like there were so many other things on the table that we were thinking about that when 2016 happened and things went a different direction. And then since then, the mindset has been like, okay, now we can lose marriage equality. Now people don't even want to think about, you know, expanding health care to include people who are non-binary or trans in different, different ways. Now people are not thinking about, you know, furthering the agenda. They're trying to maintain the current agenda um, based on those decisions. And when I think about what happened with the Supreme Court, it is a different battle. You know, people talked about this three branches of separation. Listen, those three branches are no joke. Legislative, executive, judicial, like these are serious branches of power and they do check one another. So like while, you know, Biden has this executive branch of power where he can make certain decisions, if that judicial is not judicially, <laughs> if that legislative is not legislating, I just, I, you know, it, it doesn't matter what the executive is doing. All of those branches, all three of those branches matter. And a lot of people, you know, have played around with thinking that one is over the other. But what we have seen is that all of them matter. Because I think people forgot how elections work. Some people watching this show may have forgotten how this works. As someone who does other types of politics outside of actual governmental politics, there are steps. There are steps. You have 
people who elect elected the leaders, right? You think, okay, I, I voted for President Biden, everything's good. No, you have people that's in Congress and Senate. Those people have to vote. And you just can't have Congress because Senate also matters too, right? And they have to go through committees. And then those elected officials that you elected have to be in committees, right? And then they have to look and make sure that those laws and those policies go through. And then after that, it goes on the desk of hopefully the president to sign it. And if he don't like it, he can try to veto it. But then again, that can get overruled by a two-thirds majority in the Senate, which means that you're then still at point A when you were trying to get to point D. And so that's one of the interesting things that people think about election. They only focus on, you know, oh, the national races, or they only think about the big people in charge. But all of those other people at the bottom, that influences everything. And also the type, the type of person you're electing, right? Party politics used to matter for some point in time, but then you have to think about the type of Democrats you're electing. Is this Democrat going to be a fighter? Or the type of Republicans that some people are electing? A Dr. Oz type? Or, I don't know, Mitt Romney? Still not good enough to some people, right? I see some people's faces like, meh. But you know, I remember, I tell people, the current moderate Democrats of 2022 are the 2008 Republicans, if that makes sense. Like in 2008, Republicans, well, at least black people like me knew, that Republicans in those seats that had those types of agendas, that some of them were making you know, different political ideas. We saw Sarah Palin, y'all remember Sarah Palin? The Tea Party, all those different groups. And now they've become mega supporters and fans. Like it was a small little contingency. People said, that's a joke, all oh, the Tea Party, don't pay them no mind. And then the Tea Party build and build and build. And those type of supporters, that, that, that interesting evolution of ideas and polit political ideas that we ignored. And then they kind of manifest into other people getting those seats. So now we have interesting people that's in different states that have no idea how politics work at all that's making decisions on people's bodies and livelihoods. And you can't tell me for five seconds that people that say, oh, I'm questioning if I want to vote or do my vote matter. Well, look at all the voter suppression bills that have come on the table all the different loops and dangles. If your vote, if your right to vote did not matter, if voting did not matter, let's just say, like if voting did not actually matter, then why would they put so much energy in trying to take it away from you? You know how much is important for a woman's right to choose, right? They're trying to take back women's right to choose because they know the importance of that. And, and women and others know how important it is for a woman to have the right to make that decision. Well, if they're doing the same energy for that that they're doing to the voting, then they must know that they know how voting works. We've seen the globalization of the country. The country is getting browner. The states are getting browner. Everybody's getting browner. It's true, it is. People are tanning. Listen, it's real. I mean, everyone's getting browner. Everybody wants to get some melanin, okay? And the world is changing. And the, and the, and the demographic of the population is changing as well, and they see it. And that's why they've been very, why do you think they're mad about immigration? They're upset about immigration. These conversations about voter suppression, like, stopping people from voting in local races. And so when people tell me they don't want to vote, you know, I, 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 I listen, everyone has a, you have a right to not vote, but you also have a right to the consequences that come from not voting. You can't, you know, it's like having buyer's remorse when you make a decision or something like that. I don't care about this voting. Oh my God, you're gonna take my rights away. How did I lose my rights? What happened to them? Well, you didn't vote. Well, I know, but like, it didn't have to happen. Like, what happened? says the person who did not vote, that didn't care to vote. But I'll also be clear, because I, I know some people have some different opinions about this, and I want to hear from you in the audience about this. But I don't want to call the word playing devil's advocate. I'll call it Ernest's advocate. Because <laughs> this is a different perspective. It's not actually supporting the other narrative out there. But I'm just putting this out there. Part of the reason why I think there's been a lack of voter engagement and interest isn't necessarily because of the opposition that the Republicans are doing or any other party is doing, but internally within one's party. When I think about what was, you know, Chris brought up a really good point earlier about how the Democratic Party and how people choose to vote progressively or whatnot, that some of that's happening in their own backyard. In Philadelphia, you know, you look at some of these election day post areas. This, Philadelphia is a very Democratic city. Everybody in Philadelphia is a Democrat elected for the most part. But when you look at some of these wards and you look at some of these areas and these districts, it's a lot of people who are not as enthusiastic to show up to the polls like they should or not. And so I'm curious to know about voters, about if you're in the Philadelphia area. Everyone's here in Philadelphia, yes, yes, yes. Some people live out in other areas, you know. I see y'all in the collared counties out here. 
<laughs> but um, they call them collard counties, am I right? That's collard, I, I don't know what a collard, I, I don't live in a collard county, but I heard that, that they, you know, they're, they're trimmed. So I'm curious to know from different people, like how have you felt like when you've gone to the polls, do you feel like there's people out there asking you to vote? Are you getting your sticker? What's your engagement? Yes, yes, please come up. Yes. Oh, applause before she speaks. Oh, thank you. So what's your name? Jamira. How are you? I'm good, how are you? Wonderful. So, you are a voter. Yes. And you're from Philly? Yes. Yeah, I live in Bridesburg, which is traditionally a blue collar Polish neighborhood. And it's like a little Republican pocket, which is fun. Um, we like looked at last election, we, my roommate and I looked at the breakdown and we were very Republican and yet we barely passed the Democratic candidates. Like it was real wow. close, a little too close for comfort. And so, this was happening in Philadelphia. In Philadelphia, in Philadelphia right off of 95. <laughs> wow. And so what has been, I mean, have the, you know, committee people, uh, canvassing people, people that get involved and do these type of activities, I mean, are they engaging the area enough, to, to your opinion? I don't think so. The, actually, this election cycle, I haven't seen anyone really in our neighborhood. The last election cycle, we did see more people like um, Joe Hohenstein and some of his uh colleagues have been in our neighborhood in our neighbor the last election cycle also with i don't know if you remember patty pat yes yeah she's from my neighborhood um she also was canvassing around too but not as much as hosting people thank the lord so hopefully the democratic vote will continue to work its magic in our neighborhood and prevail and cooler heads will prevail right so what is one thing that you would like to tell your committee people because you know you do every every area in philadelphia has committee people and world leaders and people like that and you have not seen anything and it's we're getting close to the election what you like to tell them because they might be watching early speaking i mean i know they're watching early speaking. <laughs> so what is what is what is one thing that you you would like them to know right now since you have not had heard anything that's happened in your ward don't count us out bridesburg can go democratic if y'all come to us and tell us we have a lot of older people mm -hmm. that they aren't necessarily engaged but if you bring the fight to them they will pick it up wow well thank you so much for that come on y'all get those yeah. get those people in your ward there are people right here that want to vote and i'm hearing that people's worldly people are not putting out literature i know there's a lot of people out here getting ready for mayoral races that are happening in the primaries but we have a race happening right here in November. And I think that's the one thing that has always personally frustrated me as a journalist is that there's always this type of energy about elections before they happen. Everyone's coming up to me asking me, yo, what do you think about the mayor's race? I'm like, I'm too busy on November 8th to be thinking about the mayor's race already. I know the mayor's race, I know the primary, the Democratic primary, but they're all Democrats and Philadelphia will most likely have a Democratic mayor. But you know what I'm hearing over there in that Bridestown or wherever he was saying, listen, that is, that's interesting. But I, I, I do want to bring this, this point around this idea of election energy. Everyone is thinking about the mayoral race next year in Philadelphia because it is a big, you know, it's a big race. I mean, we will have a new mayor. Thank goodness. But yes, clap for that. A new mayor. This is about the election special in November, but I just had to take a moment. <laughs> but we're going to have a new mayor, right? And the thing is, people are super excited. Candidates have declared already. But we have a race November 8th. And no one is talking about that more than they're talking about the mayor's race. And that's pretty much a race that we know what the outcome is going to be, but we don't know what the outcome is going to be November 8th. And it's interesting that a lot of the energy is there has been shifted towards that. And like even for myself, people were like, oh, who do you predict that's going to win? Who you this? And I'm like, you know, talk to me after November 8th. When I go to events, when I go to civic events and things, even to the people that you all know, when they ask you who you think the new mayor is going to be, you say, who do you think the new U.S. senator is going to be? You should ask that question. Who the next U.S. senator is going to be? How about that? Well, you know, I'm thinking, you know, May is around the corner and November is next door. <laughs> it's like literally next door. And the conversations, the, the, the po politicking, the meetings, the pre-meetings, I have not, I, I've, I've talked to people who are out in the political space, and that's why people do not talk to me until November 8th. I think that's the new rule we're going to tell our friends. We're not talking about any race until November 8th. Repeat after me. We're not taking any race before November 8th. Great. Even the audience right there, I know some of you are on Zoom watching. We're all agreeing. We're not talking about this until after November 8th. 
I, I promise you. I have not had no marital talks. Now, I've been a little guilty. I've talked about it on my podcast a little bit about it. But that was because, you know, we saw who was running. Now I'm over it. Now I'm focused on November 8th. So there's been some interesting conversations and questions. Um, getting curious about what people's thoughts are about the candidates that's up. We have the U.S. Senate race. I mean, most of the state rep races in Philadelphia is pretty much going to be settled and set. But I wanted to know what are some people's thoughts about some of the candidates, like Dr. Oz. You know, I know people have different thoughts about him. Some of it was shared earlier in the, so far on the show. But I'm curious to know how other people are viewing and thinking about it. Um, anybody else who thought about it? Um, you know, I'm curious about what, what black male voters think about um, Dr. Oz um, that would like to tell us how they feel. Yes, you, come up. Wonderful. Thank you. Oh, wonderful. So what's your name? Jamarcus. So tell us, as a voter, as a black millennial voter, how do you feel about Dr. Oz? I don't feel anything about him. <laughs> well. <laughs> um, you know, I know him from that doctor show. Um, don't know much about him. Don't care to know, but I will be voting better. You'll be voting better? You don't think he's better? No. Well, why? Well, you know, my, um, my, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? My Interest, values, values don't oh. align with that. With that. So you don't even have a, you just give him a different pronoun. You said that. You didn't even say them <laughs> or him. <laughs> my values don't align with that. And I just think we just need someone that knows what they're doing in the office. Right. So, I mean, but, you know, he's been out in black neighborhoods. He's been in West Philadelphia. You know, I mean, this is what they, this is, this is, he was in Northwest Philly having a panel. They, they, they're saying they're doing outreach for black men. You, you don't, you, you don't feel the outreach? Um, no. Uh, <laughs> I don't feel that outreach, don't want that outreach. <laughs> um, and, you know, I just hope that we have some black men in the community because, you know, it's, they are problematic. You know, we do have our problematic Mm -hmm. head, you know, yeah. households in our community, that they have more common sense than that. Right. You know, don't accept the turkey. Don't accept the turkey. Thank you. Don't accept the turkey, he says. It's a real thing. Don't accept that free turkey. You know about the free turkey. Don't act like you don't know about the free turkey. I've never accepted one myself, even though they've tried to offer it to me. So in inner cities, elected officials come with turkeys, like Frank Lucas and American Gangster, yes. And so an American Gangster, you know, when politicians, that's how they model them. They model themselves after Frank Lucas. Okay, Frank Lucas was a hustler, an American hustler. And he would go out, we don't, we don't have to discuss how he made his money and how he got his money, but he would come out and give, you know, turkeys in the hoods to support the community. So the community would, you know, not discuss or, you know, I mean, some people call it snitching, but they wouldn't report his behavior because they got a turkey. They got school supplies and backpacks and books. And so they minded their business and they got their turkeys and their food. So, you know, I think a lot of politicians have adopted that model of the Frank Lucas model. We're going to get some turkeys. We're going to get some school supplies. We're going to bring in the Aryan district and y'all going to let me do what I'm doing, which is nothing. Some of them. And in that case, they would benefit from that politically. So in some case, some people have modeled Dr. Oz's appearance in certain neighborhoods that he's never probably been to before. I mean, he's even been to places apparently where he's seen other black elected officials and didn't know they were elected officials and saw them in person apparently. This is, this is, what, I've, this is what I've reported. But it's interesting that during this time, there is an interest in targeted voters, black voters. And so I'm wondering, you know, how other voters feel about this election, just personally, how they're getting their, how are they having, how are you all talking to family members? Like a lot of people might be educated enough about elections. How are you talking to your friends and family that is not interested um, or have been kind of so-so about elections? Yes, you, come up. Oh, I love it. This is good. yellow fall. So what's your name? Teresa. Hi, Teresa. Hi. So tell me, um, how have you been talking to your family or folks about voting? You know, you seem like you're a voter. You look like you're energized. How are you telling people about, you know, going out to the polls in your, in your close circles? That might be kind of like, eh, I don't know about it. I'm just telling them to really just um, pay attention, do your research, uh, look up these candidates. Um, a, lot of, a lot of friends and family, they kind of, they're like me. Like, they don't really truly understand what's on at stake mm -hmm. sometimes. But I said, like, this is, this is very important. So to just really do your research, 
go to go to different meetings. Like I used to live in University City and we did a great job in terms of like canvassing. The neighbors got together. We talked about the different issues. So I just encourage them all to just find those different groups to, 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 be, to become as educated as you possibly can. Thank you, thank you. That's a good point. Points are made. Points are made. So it is interesting doing the research, looking up candidates. It's hard to do that research though. I would say from a journalistic perspective, there's so much messy news out there. I don't even know if I would call it news. I call it tabloids. Like I don't read anything from the New York Post about candidates because it's a little more salacious to my taste. I'm not saying information is not true. But I'm just saying that the, it's, it may not be in the best light or the, be, the best slant. And so it's harder now to look up candidates and see what's going on because there's a lot of noise out there, especially on social media. Like I'm on the internet a lot, clearly. Um, and there is a lot of, of just interesting things that are being said about candidates um, that makes it harder for my, my interest in engagement. Um, how do I get through trolling? How do I get through the, the minutia to get through? I mean, there's like camps now, the K-Hive, you know, who, who go after folks um, and different people or, or express democratic views. But there's different people that are on the internet, like different groups that support Dr. Oz fans, trolls, very, very big political personalities that are now on the internet. If you like a picture, share a picture, go to a rally. It's a lot of that stuff that's going on. And I think that that plays a role in how people respond or react to what's happening um, during elections. I mean, we saw what happened in the 2016 elections and still happened with the Russians that there was propaganda, memes, and stuff put out that was not coming from community. Bots, okay, this is real, this is real stuff. And you know what we see, we have people in our family called the meme folks. Y'all know the meme, not mean, the meme folks. Where they share a meme, they don't know where it came from, they don't know who said it. How many fake Denzel Washington memes are out there? Like they put his picture in a quote, the quote is not actually from him, but because it has his face, you think it has value? And then there's times you're like, I don't think Denzel Washington said that. <laughs> or, or the Harriet Tubman ones too. Like they always love to misquote Harriet Tubman. I'm like, she did not say that. We wasn't even using that slang back then. <laughs> you know, and so it's like very interesting that they're taking like different public figures and aligning them to push messaging. And this was designed and done by Russians that were putting out stuff to put out disinformation um, to drive certain political beliefs and ideas. Even the way they talk about the Republican Party with Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass Republican Party is not today's Republican Party. It's not. But they'll just do it. It's like, I don't know, like when you think about Machino or different types of brands of clothing that's sold on Target. The Target brand is not the same as the current brand. Or as they say, Target or Target. It is the same, but some things are not. And so I think about that politically, how people will make those alignments. And you know, when I think about people like Dr. Ross who come to Philadelphia and the information that is sent, like the narratives and the ads, are people watching, just a quick small hand raise, are people watching the ads? Have you all seen any political ads of going up this, this cycle? It is, it is, it's a lot. These, some of these ads that have been going out have been extreme. I know the ones about Fetterman, there was some from, I guess, supporters of Oz who said that, you know, crime, the, the crime rate is going to go high. You know, hide your kids, hide your, hide your wives, you know, that kind of, you know, get your musket type of energy. I don't have a musket, I just think that's what they will do. You know, I'm thinking of like Johnny Crockett and people going back and getting them. But that's the way they're looking at it. They're saying like, you gotta get your stuff, you're high. The, the crime rate, and then they like to blame, uh, you know, folks that have nothing to do with the race. You know, they say that, why am I in it? They use Krasner as, you know, Larry Krasner DA. And I'm like, what does Krasner gotta do with, with, with Fetterman? But they'll make that, they'll say, look, look at the crime here. Dr. Oz is gonna fix crime. I'm like, can he even fix crime in his own house? Can he even fix the issues in this? I mean, I just, the, 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 the information that's out there, the memes, the graphics, the videos, it is a lot that's happening to try to get people not to, you know, show up to the polls in different types of ways or make people question their voting altogether. But I'm also curious, though, about other issues around voting that, you know, we talk about it in the sense of like, we're all gonna show up to the polls and vote. But why are some real reasons why people are not voting that does not have anything to do with the other side of politics? which is very interesting. Like a lot of people, you know, that don't have different thoughts. Yes, come up. I want to hear from different people, like what does have people motivate them to go to the polls? Oh, I have a special guest. <laughs> so what's your name? Uh, Barry. Oh, wonderful. That's a nice name. So um, tell us about, um, why do you think people are not going to the polls outside of voting? 
Um, mainly because it might not be accessible. Um, some people, you know, everyone doesn't have a salary job. Some people work nine to five or they might work at like retail. So they might not be able to take off or they may lose money from taking off. Um, so making sure that people are able to vote by mail um, and just expanding their right to vote. Um, that's really crucial. Um, so that's another reason why, um, you know, the upcoming elections are really important. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Very good thoughts. Inaccessibility, which is another aspect that people don't talk about. We often think that if people are not voting, they're not voting because they actually want the other person to win or, you know, they just don't care how the election is going to go. But there has been some conversations about mail-in voting. Mail-in voting is still happening. I personally am a fan of mail-in voting because I, like, I don't do lines. I, I don't do lines with anything. So I, I just feel like, but I would wait in line to vote. I did wait in line to vote for my first time. My first presidential chance I was able to vote was in 2012 for Obama for president. Yes, I was so excited about that. I waited in a long line. It was pinned, so you know how the kids are. So it was like a long line, but it was worth the wait. But in certain cases, when people have to make the decision, because we have to be real about where we are in the economy right now. We're like in recession mode. People are having those conversations about when they can go to the polls and vote. And I think that in 2022, I just think that there's too many people on the ground helping to assist that we should be able to make it a, a better process for people to go out to the polls and vote. People are paying poll workers more now, which is a good thing. People are trying to get more people involved, but there needs to be more on the ground work. You know, we have a system, and, and then we're gonna talk about that. We have a system in Philadelphia and also across the country, but really in Pennsylvania, in the Commonwealth, there is a conversation about voter turnout and engagement. That is not just falling from the sky. It's not just up to you. There is money being laid out for committee people, for ward leaders, for different people, different levels. the commissioner. We have a commissioner. We have commissioners in the city that look over voting. They're to make sure that people are voting and things are happening in proper order so there won't be any issues. The, the, it's not just on you all. You all pay money, taxpayers' dollars, go to commissioners to actually make sure elections happen. And I don't know if they're sleeping behind the job in Philadelphia or they got too comfortable. I don't know if they're having communication with ward leaders or committee people. But it's a whole system that has to also be replenished. There are people who are doing the work on committees, in the ground, making the work, having the conversations with their people to make sure voter turnout is happening. And there's people I've talked to that is in the system, in the process, in the practice, that have mixed ideas about how voter turnout can be better. Because a lot of people that's doing the volunteer are, are, are people that are like very, very senior, been doing it for 20 years, over a decade, and they're holding on to that power and those resources when there's younger people, new people with bright ideas and fresh ideas to try to get people to show up to the polls because that's volunteer work. Now they get lunch and things, but it's work that is oftentimes being underutilized. Um, I remember volunteering to help with election a couple years ago, and you'll be surprised of the people that sit there at those polls at those things, making sure people sign in the IDs. That's a process. And a lot of those people that are doing that work are not you know people that you expect to right you're thinking there's going to be some young person with a with a booklet you know those people show up to go to the rallies but those are not the people that are actually showing up the day of the election day there is the rally there are the rally crew and then there's the election day crew and they are not the same you go to listen you go to rallies right there was rallies all over and it's all those young people canvassing getting people to go out to vote they're with this group and you're thinking in your head when you go to election day that that's going to be the same crowd that's going to be there it is not they come in up until, once that, like 2016 is a textbook example. I was following the Clemson race against Trump, and you, you saw all these young people out, you know, asking me where they registered to vote, you know, before the election day. I'm like, oh, these are the young, eager people that's gonna show up and be, you know, election day. Come the election day, it was an older lady at the front who been there, she tired, she got her coffee on the table, and she's the one making sure my ID was there. Where are those people? Where do they go? And then when the polls show up, people say, well, how did that happen? Because I swore I saw so much young energy. No, 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 they were there before the election. They were there before the election, which made all the difference. So I'm curious from other people about election day experiences. Do anyone have any election stories, experiences that happened to them? What motivates them to go to the polls? Yes, you, I see you, come up. Wonderful. Yeah. Oh, dressed all up. You can be a co-host, how are you doing? So what's your name? I'm Josh. How are you doing, Josh? I'm doing well. So what gets you excited about going to, to elected? Do you have any election day stories or motivations that get you hyped to go to the polls? Since people just really, you know, think that people just show up and vote. I mean, I kind of do that, but who knows? 
Well, 2020, I was extremely excited to obviously get Biden elected, you know, see change in the country and all of that. So when I went to the polls, I, w I wanted to go to the polls. Lines were out the door, but I was okay. excited to see that in Philadelphia because I'm like, if there's lines in Philly, I know where we're voting. That's right. True. So I'm like, I could see like just the energy. And when we were all in line, people were like chanting. People were excited. So even though it was chaotic, the lines were crazy, you know, people were getting a little frustrated. We there was just so much excitement because we were ready for change. So it was like a Beyonce concert. It was. It okay. was. So it's like we're in line, but we're like all vibing. We were all like so excited. I think the fact that we like get there and we see the line was so long. I think we were all like, OK, we got this. We got this. We got this. So I was, and, and, and people did have yeah. it. I mean, ended up winning yeah. Philadelphia ended up helping win. Absolutely. How do you feel about midterms? You think it's gonna be like that? I'm. I'm scared. I yeah. think that that's the word that's kind of going around right now. And I know where I'm voting. You know, Fetterman's got my vote. Shapiro has my vote. Absolutely. Without a doubt. And I'm I will stand in line for how, however long it takes to get them elected. But it's just it's hard to see, you know, where people are at right now. And something you mentioned was like people are worried about the economy. People are worried about recession. People are worried about their jobs. And, you know, with things like that, I hope that people keep the the big things in focus. So big things like rights, women's rights, black rights, LGBT rights, minority rights, like that to me is way more important than anything else right now. And I hope people keep that perspective and keep that energy. Thank you. We're gonna keep that energy. Thank you so much. Thank you. So he's like standing in lines. I was like very much the person in line. Like I like, I mean, you know, I mean, if it's voting, we're voting, it's voting. Yes, excitement, waiting in lines. And I guess if it's a good line too. There have been rules, apparently, elections now where they're telling people not to, like, you can't feed people in certain lines now. I was hearing that you can't give people snacks now. Um, it's a lot. This is why I'm so happy about mailing vote. Take advantage of mailing voting if you have not. Go online, do all the things you need to do, but make sure that you take advantage of mailing voting because everybody think that there's going to be a whole day blocked out, but show anything can happen. Weather, rain, noise, anything can happen that can, like, completely take you off guard. But that's a really good point about the enthusiasm of people going to the polls. I, um, I think that, you know, 2020 was a good example of that. But, like, I don't know. Is it, you know, I'm thinking of Beyonce concert now where everyone's like, excited to go on the line. But is this going to be a different way in midterms? Are we going to be sitting here waiting for visuals, you know, for music videos of our, of our faves? And is that going to be the different type of line? That's a different lie. Like, the waiting of the, the visuals line is different from the concert. Anyway, I'm just being biased. But... I do think to myself that the enthusiasm around elections and how people are showing up um, makes all the difference, you know, because I think when I went to my polling place, you know, it's weird, like in certain areas where you go and it's like 12 people and it's like two o'clock. It is very different for different people. And a lot of times when we look at these voter turnouts in areas that are lower income, that are being impacted by socioeconomic issues. The voter turnout is very different, not because people don't care, because people have to actually work. There's been conversation about having Election Day be a national holiday. Um, the idea of Election Day being a national holiday, uh, which I think could be useful to some degree. Like, I mean, what do people think about that? Like, Election Day itself being an actual federal holiday? Think so? People pro for it? People pro for it? I do. I think. I, I, I've gotten to the point where I've begun to think that Election Day should be. Because, I mean, we have, we, we had Columbus Day off. And then we reframe it to Indigenous People's Day. People get off on President's birthdays. I mean, I get why people get off on October 12th. I, too, am a president. And I think October 12th should be a holiday. No, but to the point of a week, well, there was a time where Columbus Day and my birthday were aligned on the same dates. And so I personally just thought, like, maybe we could just swap those out. It could be. It could work. But, like, I just do think that Election Day should be um, a federal holiday. I think that it wouldn't give people more incentive to a paid, a paid day off federal holiday. Emphasis on paid federal day off. Certain people on other sides of the fence, Republicans, are very much not for this idea. Because you know, to make federal holidays, it costs some type of money. Because you have to take days off that people are not working. But if we do value elections as much as we do, and we claim that democracy is on the line, then how come the one day where everybody technically should be off is a day that nobody wants to be off? So it's just something to think about. Things that you can, you know, advocate for your people to be on. People that you can fight. People that you can demand people to. Because a lot of people right now are like second guessing whether or not their vote even matters right now. I'm here to tell you that it do. But I also think it's important to be realistic that voting is not the only part 
of civic engagement and participation. We have First Amendment rights. Voting now is one of them. It's not in the First Amendment, it's in other amendments, of course. It makes all the difference for everyone able to vote. But the most important thing is that people get caught up in the voting aspect. They said, I voted in 2020, now it's 2022, I didn't get what I wanted. It's like, well, you know, voting was one part of it, but did you vote? You know, elections are every six months. Did you know that? Did you know elections are every six months? I actually asked a, a sibling, I'm not gonna name who it is. I said, when, did, when is elections? He says, like, isn't it every four years? I said, elections for everything. Yeah, every four years. I said, no, there's mayor races, there's primaries, there's other elections and races that happen. But people really only think, most people only vote for the ones, if you ask me the last time they voted, they said for Biden, that was two years ago. There's been a lot of elections that have happened since then. We had a DA's race. And the same people that was mad about the DA, I'm like, well, did you even vote in that primary? And they said no. But they were mad at him anyway. Well, you could have took your rage to the polls. You could have took your anger to the polls. You could have done some other things. But for starters, I think the more civic conversation about civic engagement, and beyond just this election, but since we are talking about November 8th, there's elections every six months. In Pennsylvania and Philadelphia, there is elections every May and every November, primaries every cycle. Now, different states across the country have primaries all over the place. When I was hearing about primaries in the summer, I was like, summer primaries? But other, other states have it. But in Pennsylvania, it is really big. There's primaries every, there's elections every six months. So in May, we'll be talking about the mayor's race. But remember, we're not talking about that till after what date? November 8th. We're not talking about it until after November 8th. I don't want to, I don't care. They're like, who's the next mayor? I'm thinking about who's the next governor. I'm thinking about the next senator. And so part of it is, yes, voting every six months is important. But what's also very important is being involved in the process itself. Like, there's other things going on. You know, in our audience, we have people who are working in wards, making sure elections matter. It's not just simply dealing with races and doing those races only when it's the bottom line. It shouldn't take people being scared that all their rights are going to be taken away to go to the polls. You should be wanting to vote anyway. I mean, people are critical about all types of different people. Dog catcher. I mean, you don't like the dog catcher? You can, you know, switch the dog catcher out. If you don't like, the, if you don't like your sheriff, you can, you can switch the sheriff out. I don't even know why we still have sheriffs in America, but I, that's another conversation for another episode of Ernestine Speaking. But it is a real thing, though. We do have all of these seats that are open, and they're every six months. And so I'm just always open and curious about what people are doing outside of voting. For some people who are voting, clearly, but what are other things? Activists, protests, people that go out, people that disrupt. How do you disrupt civilly? How do you disrupt and outside things that you're doing? Yes, you, come up. Come, please. Yes, we have another person. Telling us about their voting. Welcome to the show. Hello, thank How you. How are you? What's your name? My name is Amber. Wonderful, Amber. So what are you doing outside of voting? Because I know a lot of people also think that, oh, the only way you can make disrupt and make change is voting, which is true. Voting's one way. That's a cool way. But outside of voting, what are the things that you think people should be doing to, you know, be involved civically? I think um, education, honestly, is the foundation of everything. Um, I work in the education field, so creating spaces for people to have conversations, uh, to be able to learn more. I know for me, I don't really watch the news because it's very mm -hmm. depressing. So, yes. you know, except for honestly speaking, <laughs> right? <laughs> except for honestly speaking, but I'm like, you know, curating my Twitter timeline even to make sure that I have open, you know, information to not just one side but both sides to understand. Like, okay, like not only am I just going down this one way track, but I've, you know compared it to other perspectives and been like, actually, yeah. no, this is actually what I believe, except values, like what's in line with my values. Uh, so I think education is the first thing and then educating others in your circle of influence. So like having those conversations with my peers um, that I may not be going to the polls or having conversations with my parents who are in a different generation and may not understand what the new age things are. I had a conversation with my mom about pronouns recently. That was a whole ordeal. But like then she could understand more about trans rights because of that crack in the door and be able to have that conversation. So I think education for sure. Education for sure. I agree with you. Thank you. <laughs> educating people. Educating. And that is not just voting and scare people to go to the polls. I've heard all types of new incentives for polls. Free haircuts people are giving out, which I love a haircut. I don't know about a free haircut, but I love haircuts. But it's, it's a thing, incentives. People like food, food. I love food. No, I love food. I love free food too. 
I think the freer the better. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> but yes, I, I mean, there's other ways to do it. And I think sometimes often people think about making civic change around voting. And voting, I think it's this and thus. You know, I think that's the most important thing. I think doing the things that it's this and thus, making it more. You just can't have one thing at a time. You just can't be focused, laser focuses on one aspect of it. Um, because everyone's like, oh, I got to vote. I, I got to vote. Yes, you have to vote. But there's other things that have to happen year round. Because let's, let's be clear, politicians who want to suppress the right to vote and suppress rights, they're working around the clock. Okay, there is a senator that I talk about a lot um, that people think are just, I don't, they don't talk about him enough, Mitch McConnell. Yes, Senator Mitch McConnell. Yes, from, yes, he's a, he's a fascinating person. Not in like fascinating as in, oh, I love him. No, but more so in the fascinating way that he is invested. He has been invested in changing that Supreme Court since Robert Borked, the term Borked came about because of what happened to him. Um, when Mitch McConnell was younger and he was a baby Darth Vader, not the, where we are now, he was in a position of power where he had so much influence. Um, and he saw a guy go for the Supreme Court named Robert Bork, who he did one to appoint. Back then, the Supreme Court wasn't super political. I know, that's weird to say. But like partisan political in the way that we know it today, right? And so this guy did not get it. The Democrats, you know, borked him is how they, they said it. He lost. McConnell on the floor, and he says afterwards, once this happens, if we're going to start, if we're going to start having these issues over nominees, you all better. Bring. He promised that he was going to make sure his per his person goes through. So after Robert Bork, there was a couple other people, but then we get to Clarence Thomas, and that's when the showdown went down. Republicans had that majority; they had that group. They fought through, and there were some moderate Democrats. We won't name who those moderate Democrats are. Maybe one of them in the White House right now, but. He was in a position to say they got Clarence Thomas through. And after that, Supreme Court hearings were very, very one-sided. So if you had to, if the, it didn't matter who the person was. You could be Brett Kavanaugh. You could be whoever you want to be. Whoever was running the show dictated how the Supreme Court nominations would go. It didn't change for anyone. No exceptions were made. Look at what happened with Katenji Jackson Brown. That had to happen. That was, you think that she would have gotten important under a Trump administration? No. That happened because people had to vote. Voted in 2020, and that's how we got the first black woman to be a Supreme Court justice. <laughs> pretty good damn deal. Yes, pretty good deal. Pretty big damn deal. But those issues that happened, though, with those types of elections and races, we were wondering how did Roe v. Wade happen? How did those Supreme Court? It started with the people we elected. It, it goes back to it. I feel like if, you just, if you're protesting only, but without the voting part, you're protesting something that's a decision that's already been made. You know what I mean? Like it's like going to a sold out concert and, and, and demanding to get in when it's, the, the concert is sold out. That's kind of how it is with the Supreme Court. Once they stacked up the court, then protesting outside and say, let me in, they're like, oh, oh no, this was already done. You should have had your ass in the thing making sure that someone else got elected. But people were feeling different types of ways. People were frustrated. People were doing different stuff. So it's like, we don't want to be Johnny come lately this election cycle. I think now people's mindset about preserving people's right to vote, people's rights, is, is a, it's, it's, a one, it's not a one-way street. You know, it requires different energies and different focuses. And it requires different people to care and have empathy for other people's rights. So, okay, I'm not a woman, but at the end of the day, I do care about a woman's right to choose. Like the radical feminist who spoke earlier. Yes. I might not be HIV positive, but I know people who are, and I care about those individuals having the right to medical care and the resources that they need. And so it's almost about having empathy when you go to the polls, bigger than just yourself. I think a lot of people get caught up in, well, you know, I'm good, I'm fine. You know, I own my house. It's about real estate issues, I own my house. I already paid all my bills, I'm good. But what about those people who have those issues and those struggles? What about those people who don't, right? Who don't, who don't have those abilities, right? And I also use it in a metaphorical sense that when you do vote and you're in a country where other people do not have equal justices and protections, that that does trickle down and impact the work that you do. If you're somebody that is in education, if you're somebody that is in public services, if you're in a situation where there is an economy that's failing a vast majority of, of Americans and, and people from being able to do what they need to do, that impacts your work. Do you think about that? Like if you're a doctor and you're getting six figures or you're a millionaire, you, you're making tons of money in the health department, 
if a lot of people have bad health care, then that means you're going to have more patients. And if you look at what the impact of what happened with COVID in that situation, we see how the Medicare system has been disrupted. But we also got to remember who voted in those policies or did not or took out funding from those policies. All of those things had a very negative impact on how people felt about themselves and also how people access support. So I'm thinking to myself now about how we become more empathetic people. How do we value and really take seriously people's interest in their compassion? Like, how do we say, look, I'm going to the polls. I might be feeling okay about the country. I don't feel okay about the country. I'm just saying, for example, for those voters, white women, not white women in this audience. So I'm curious. I want to find a, let me see. Yes, you, come up. Yes. Love to get your thoughts. Hi, I love your outfit. Thank you. That's so, what's yours. your name? Laura. Hi, Laura. Hi. So, tell me, how do you feel about the polls and excited? Like, how are you showing up to the polls? How are you getting people enthusiastic to vote? And overall, I mean, so much is going on. People are looking at people like you to save us. Okay. <laughs> so, how are you showing up? So, I think that, like Josh was saying, I think you need to take a really a longer perspective and have a longer vision. Look backwards and look forwards. Myself, I'm the daughter of refugees, so I never forget that, and I don't let my daughter forget that. So I'm not voting just for me. I'm voting for what came before, what came after. And I don't feel like anything's ever settled. I'm never complacent about it, because if you think about it, women had the right to vote briefly, and yeah. then the end of the 18th, like the beginning of the 18th century, it was gone. People don't always know that. Yeah. But like things can always happen. We're never, it's never settled. So I always think about that and think about what protecting what's really important and not letting perfect be the enemy of good. Wonderful, thank you so much. It's a very good point. Women like her are gonna be voting on November 8th, making sure those collared counties get collared in the right way. And also too, to be sure, I mean, it's a really good point about legacy too. You know, I think about my grandmother who was during the civil rights movement, one of those people who was out there making sure people had the right to vote. You know, a lot of people who don't think about the family lineage of folks that grew up before us, that was really big on trying to get people to be more civically involved and engaged. Yeah, they worked, and they worked harder than us, a lot of us. They didn't have, you know, check-in jobs and cell phones and stuff. I don't know how they made it to those marches with no cell phones. I just don't get it, because I'd be lost. I'd be texting people like, how did I get here? How do I get here? They, they, listen, they were like, you got to be here at 8 o'clock sharp, or you're not getting on the bus. I would have been like a little fashionably late. I don't know. They was able to pull it off without technology and cell phones and Twitter and social media. And they made sure that they went out to the polls and did it. And so I do think about that in many ways, to Laura's point and to others, is that there is, there is no settling. Like even when you think things are settled, it's really never that settled. And I think that's what inspires me to go to the polls and for me to vote, and I hope the audience do as well, that many people like you you know, November 8th is a big deal. It's a really, really big deal. And people that's watching this right now, people who are in my Zoom live Zoom audience, people who are watching at home, people who are engaged, right? We have a really important assignment, okay? Do not mess this up. You know the assignment. The assignment is we have to make sure that our democracy is in the right place. We have to make sure that we're voting. And we're actually doing more than just voting, okay? We're making sure that we follow our timeline. We can't think about the next election until we focus on election in front of us. I can't think about the mayor right now and so I think about the governor and the senator and what's happening there. And even if I personally do not feel, again, not talking for myself, that this election is as extremely important to myself, I have friends, sisters, mothers, and others who do care, right? And that's what's more important to me to drive. So let's go from just thinking about ourselves to being empathetic. Let's be all of those things. And let's make sure that we vote on November 8th. And let's make sure that we encourage other people too. Let's make sure that we keep the energy going because we have another election in six months and another six months and another six months. And I look at it like, you know, upgrading my laptop, you know, or upgrading my cell phone, you know, upgrading my stuff, you know, switching my, they say you have to switch out your passwords every year. All of that kind of stuff matters. So I hope to see you at the polls and vote on November 8th. And as always, be well and be best.